Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back for Tuesday training. It's 9 a.m. on Tuesday. I'm your host, Tony Merwin. I'm here every Tuesday, uh, sometimes with some great guests like we have today, bringing you actionable content that you guys can put in your business and make a little bit extra money, help a few more people, right? Because ain't that what it's about? Having my morning coffee, as you can see there, this coffee is making me awesome. I actually think it might be the other way around. Pretty sure I'm the one making the coffee awesome. Uh, but we got a great show for you. We got one of the Invictus speakers coming up on the show, Miss Adela Cochran. Super excited to have her on here. Uh, as always, we got a little bit of news that I want to tackle with you guys uh, and just a few quick announcements. Um, as always, like these lovely gentlemen are doing here, make sure you click the little link up in the description to let Facebook view your StreamYard comments. That way you're not anonymous. I know who you are and I can see your name there and have a little fun. We've got uh, as usual, we always got Mr. Ryan England, Joe Camper. We got Alex Hankey tuning in the show and Grace Avila. So thank you all for coming. A uh, couple of other things real quick in regard. If you're following the development Invictus and getting ready for this event, a couple of things. Number one, it's taken off. Uh, VIP tickets are sold out. As a matter of fact, they're, they're gently oversold. Uh, so we are at capacity for VIP, but we do still have general admission tickets left. We've got a uh, promo code in the syndicate. If you want to buy a ticket 30% off, use promo code syndicate, uh, or, or there's still a promotion going where if you just book two nights using our discount code at the Omni, you'll get a free ticket and you can come have fun. So I was looking over some of the final details for Invictus and just to mention something for all of you guys that like food, uh, the food served at Invictus is going to be tip top. So you guys are going to be catered lunch, dinner. I mean, the whole thing is going to be put on really well. So Get excited for that. It is going to be an outstanding event. And again, that promo code's in the bottom, which is uh, Syndicate. And uh, you get 30% off or just book your room at the Omni and you get a free ticket altogether. So that's Saturday or that's uh, in San Antonio, I should say, um, July 12th through the 14th. We're going to have a welcome social uh, full session with breakouts on Thursday and then another full session on Friday. And we've definitely got some stacked speakers. And as always... I've got a little bit of news for you guys. So real quick, um, as you know, I always like to point out the fraud that's going on in Medicare. And uh, well, this guy definitely took advantage of it. Uh, if you read this article, and this is straight from the Department of Justice, one of their news releases, uh, but it says that a chief compliance officer is convicted of $50 million in a Medicare fraud scheme. Uh, basically, a gentleman named Stephen King, age 45 of Miramar, he is the chief compliance officer of a pharmacy holding company that fraudulently billed Medicare over $50 million for dispensing lidocaine and diabetic testing supplies that beneficiaries did not need or want. King and his co-conspirators operated A1C Holdings, which held pharmacies in various states, including All American Medical Pharmacy in Warren, Michigan. And when A1C secured prescriptions and refills on behalf of its pharmacies for medically unnecessary lidocaine and diabetic testing supplies, it violated Medicare and pharmacy benefit manager rules. Pretty simple. The jury convicted King of conspiracy to commit health care fraud and wire fraud. His sentencing is scheduled for September 14th. And he faces a maximum penalty of 20 years in prison. This guy was the chief compliance officer of, for a pharmacy company. He's supposed to be basically the last measure to prevent this type of stuff, right? He is supposed to be heading up the programs that prevent pharmacy or pharmacists from submitting these incorrect prescriptions. But instead... He's signing off on them, pushing them through, and obviously they're stealing money from Medicare. So, you know, Medicare's busting at the seams with uh, with debt, so to speak, or certainly uh, struggling to pay its bills in some cases. Everybody talks about how the Part A hospital fund continues to diminish. Uh, and as much as Medicare is costing, uh, it's guys like this that are, that are increasing the problem. So uh, I always like to point it out when I see some fraud happening in the Medicare space. And as far as I'm concerned, I hope they do lock this dude up for 20 years. So. Uh, moving on, next in the news, this is also a Medicare deal. Uh, big Medicare changes coming for postal service retirees. So they recently changed a few rules for postal retirees. Uh, it says here, you may have seen the headlines, but the US, USPS, US Postal Service, has been losing money. So if it's losing money, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to start reducing your benefits as a postal service worker. Pretty standard. So big questions. Uh, basically, what it says here is starting January 1st of 2025, 
Postal Service Health Benefit Plans. PSHB is Postal Service Health Benefit Plans. Will be available only to Postal Service employees, annuitants, and their eligible family members. They will not be able to enroll or continue enrolling in federal employee health benefit plans. So they're taking away their op their option to enroll in the federal uh, employee health benefit plans, and they will only be able to enroll in Postal Service health benefit plans. And to top that, they are now required to enroll in Medicare Part B as part of the program. So they're removing them from FEHB. They're requiring them to stick with PSHB, and they have to have Medicare Part B. That's a lot of Bs and acronyms in there. Uh, and then it goes on to say that those that are under 65 with PSHB plans not yellow eligible for Medicare, uh, will be able to then obviously defer that Part B enrollment until after retirement. Pretty simple. So if you have some postal service employees in your, in your network, maybe in your client list or your roster, or you know, some out there, uh, they are going to be having some questions regarding how they're going to, uh, move forward with, as they move into retirement, because they will no longer be on the federal employee health plans. So pretty simple stuff there. A little bit of news for you guys. Uh, and I'm super excited for the show. I met the guest that we have today. Uh, I'm Well, saw her online like I meet most people, right? You meet a lot of people virtually. You see them out there on LinkedIn. You see them making posts. So you kind of get to know them through reputation a little bit. And then eventually you get to meet them face to face. And I met this lady at the uh, at last year uh, at a devoted health plan rollout, right? Basically, devoted came in, was telling everybody about their new plans they got in Austin. And I got to spend some time with her and learn about her. And I've been following her quite a bit and certainly excited to have her speaking at the Invictus Conference uh, not only does she do a fantastic job building her agency, she runs an agency here in Austin called the Cochran Group. Got about 25 years serving Austin, Texas, uh, mainly in the retirement space. Medicare, uh, they do some ACA as well, certainly Medicare Advantage, Medicare Supplements, Annuities, Life Insurance, etc. cetera. Um, but not only does she have a lot of experience running her agency here in Austin, but she develops top producers. Uh, just not too long ago, one of her producers was being promoted on LinkedIn by United Healthcare for winning basically the number one top producer award, what have you. So super excited to get her on. We're going to bring her on right now. Her name is Adela Cochran. What is happening? How are you today? Hi, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. Good to see you. So what, uh, I know who you are because I've been following you and we've gotten to know each other, but some of these people, you know, they don't know who the heck Adela Nino Cochran is. So if you don't mind, just take a little moment, introduce yourself to the audience, let them know what you're about. Well, um, like you said, I've been in here and, um, the Cedar Park, Austin area now for close to 30 years. Been doing insurance in this space for about 25 years. Um, actually became an agent in 2004. So I've been actually doing this for 19 years. Okay. Um, and um, uh, I was helping my mom. My mom is a retired insurance uh, broker herself. So been in the industry for a long time. Um, and have seen different changes from when she was in, of course, to to now. Um, but uh, originally born and raised in the Rio Grande Valley, so I am a Texas girl. Uh, joined the Marine Corps when I was 18. Uh, served eight years, got out, moved back to uh, to Texas. But I did not want to go back to the Rio Grande Valley, so I moved to Austin. So been here ever since, and um, I'll proceed leaving. I traveled too many times moving constantly with the Marine Corps. So after that, it's kind of like you find your space and it's like, let's just stay here. And uh, I love it. Well, I am with Mr. Joe Camper. Thank you for your service. We got a few <laughs> other people tuning in to thank you for that. And I'd love to kind of touch on that because um, okay. I think that's super impressive. What made you at 18 go join the Marine Corps? It was actually pretty crazy because um, I had a, I've been ex, uh, accepted already to go to school, and um, my brother had just come back from boot camp. Uh, I come from a long family of Marines, oh. um, but to date I'm the only the only woman who has joined. Um, so they're all guys, and um, I remember one time my brother had come home and he was just teasing. Me. He was like, "You." you wouldn't be able to make it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> yes, I can. He goes, I bet you a hundred dollars. You wouldn't make, you wouldn't, you wouldn't join. You wouldn't be able to pass boot camp. And I was like, oh, watch me. 
without even thinking, I went down there, signed my name on the dotted line. Two weeks later, I was at Paris Island, South Carolina, at the Marine Corps Depot. <laughs> um, you know, it was a crazy thing, um, but it was the best thing I ever did in my life. Um, Why do you say that? The things that I learned, you know, not only um, the independence that I gained, um, ability to see I could do without it, you know, because there's so many things that people say, you can't do this, you can't do that, or, you know, and you you start to think it. Um, just a little backstory. I am the kid of generations of migrant workers. Okay. Uh, when people when people hear that, they go, what? And I was like, you worked in the fields? Absolutely. My family worked in the fields and um, till the age of 12. And that teaches you a lot. Mm. You know, uh, there's a lot that you learn as um, with that kind of hard work. It just takes a lot of diligence and discipline to do something like that. Yeah. Um, but watching my parents, both my parents were such go-getters. Um, at the age of 12, my dad had raised enough money. He had paid off. He bought a house the year I was born, paid it off in five years, saved enough money the next seven years that he basically said, we're done. We're not doing this anymore. And um, he bought himself, um, basically bought my mom a car, bought everything to start a new business. He was one of the biggest um, um, construction, construction contractors in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, and so I learned a lot from them. My mom went on to do insurance and I saw how devoted she was and how um, she was always a top earner. And so there was a lot that I learned from them that following into the Marine Corps just kind of built on that. So the discipline that you learn in the Marine Corps, the leadership skills that you develop uh, leading different teams. Um, one of the things that I did was I was stationed at headquarters Marine Corps, which is, which is in Washington, DC. So ran in a lot of political circles with that, with the general that I worked with. Um, so, um, I was the admin chief for him, did a little stint, not uh, nothing to where I was there for a long time, but was the admin chief at the office at, um, at SecNav. And it was just a temporary thing. It wasn't like I did that for a long time. I went back. It was kind of like a joint thing with a major that I, uh, with a major general that I was with. So went back to headquarters Marine Corps, did a lot of um uh, details led a lot of teams for um, different parade ceremonies and just you know different missions that had to get done people going out in the field um, when um, desert shield broke out before desert storm did a lot of work with that in planning and logistics so you know just working with a lot of people that helped me hone those uh skills mm -hmm. on how to prepare and how to um, plan and forecast and develop people and acquire different things, right? So um, the big, um, I would say the big skills that I learned in talent and acquisition was all through the Marine Corps. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's I've done. And then I got out and started doing this and been doing this ever since. You went, you came straight into insurance after the Marine Corps? Actually, no, I was a, I, um, I opened an interior design company and okay. did that for a while. And um, while well, I raised my kids and I was married and, um, you know, it just was not, um, even though interior design is one of my passions, I'm not, it's not really what I wanted to do. Okay. I enjoy I enjoy the building of people and building successful people. Um, that is my passion. So um, 
I got my license in 2004 and started doing doing insurance and never looked back. Understood. Yeah, it's probably hard to develop leaders in the interior design space. I wouldn't think there's a lot of opportunity for that, is there? But certainly um, plenty of it in insurance. I'm sorry? I was saying that there, there's probably not a lot of opportunity for leadership development in the interior oh. design space. No, not really. And it, it's it just I really got tired of uh, <laughs> just to say I really got tired of people thinking that a delay in their couch was a life or death situation. You know what I mean? <laughs> Understood completely. So you gravitated over to insurance in 04. You said your mom was already working in that space and you kind of came in to help her a little bit. Was she doing pretty much the same market that you're in now? Life and annuities and, and retirement yes. stuff? Yes, that's what she was doing down in the Rio Grande Valley. Okay. So I was so I was helping her, and um, during that transition, uh, I uh, into insurance. Um, I went through a divorce, and I was like, "Mom, what am I going to do?" And she goes, "What do you mean? What are you going to do?" I'm like, "How am I going to? Um, I need to find a I need to find a career where I'm going to make money." And she goes, you're helping me with it. And she goes, she goes, and, and she was right. You know, it's just one of those that I always tell the agents, it's the one thing where you go, geez, how am I going to make this? But it's the only, it's the only career out there that you can be broke on Monday and be out of it by Friday. Yeah. You know, and so um, a lot of it is, you know, just how much are you willing to invest? How how dedicated, right? So that is the one thing that I teach the agents is, what are you doing? What how does your what does your week look like, right? Because your week your week is going to, um, it's going to produce the outcome that you want by Friday. So if you're not doing anything and you're not planning anything for your week, well, then the, the week is going to plan you, right? Life is going to plan you. So life has to come in where your work week, you know, where you can fit it in your mm -hmm. work week. So true. I've always believed that, too. If you don't run your week, your week will definitely run you mm -hmm. and everything. You become more reactionary to things that are happening versus right proactively going out there and moving the football, so to speak. Exactly. So Exactly. Did, so you learned obviously some leadership development through the Marine Corps. Did you have a team of people that you were kind of leading, training, developing there as well? Or, or was that just yes. more of the basic values that the Marine Corps taught you? Yes, I did. Um, and it all, it all varied by wherever I was. So if I was at Camp Pendleton, it was a little different. Um, there, I was more of a squad leader which, where I was responsible for six agents, I mean, six recruit, uh, um, six Marines. And then when I went to um, um, Memphis was my next duty station. There, um, I was responsible for maintaining the records of, um, you know, gosh, it was something like 800 Marines. And so you have, um, you, now, when I say maintaining their records, I saw them constantly coming in and, and they'd come to me and it's like, I need help with this and this and this. And I'd be like, have you done this, this and this, you know? So, um, but um, in, that set, in that capacity, I had another six people in my team. Um, and then when I went to headquarters Marine Corps, that was a little different. Sure. Because... Sure you know, major, uh, you know, captains and majors and, you know, they're all over the place. And then you have generals all over the place. So there I only had three people okay. to help me because I was the admin chief. So in that office, I had three um, Marines that I had to make sure that they helped with taking care of all the different officers. So there was different levels before they got to me, before they got to the general. So, right. All right. Yeah. So in 04, you transitioned to insurance. You're working with your mom. You're obviously not leading the story there yet. You're you're no. taking her. You're, she's kind of taking you under your wing. Yes. Yes, she was. And then she was, she said, you really need to, um, because you're down, I'm down in the valley. You're not mm -hmm. moving down. She 
he goes, um, you know, I'm doing different insurance than for what you want to do. Um, find somebody local. To and work with? So, yes. She goes, so I want you to see different, um, different um, managing styles, different. I want you to get exposed to different lines of insurance. Um, and so that was one of the best things that she did, right? Because we always feel like um, if we have an agent that we're going to be the one that's going to teach them. I've always believed if, have you met Charles Prince? Uh, I, I know that name. I think I have. He's with met Devoted. Him. Yeah. He's with Devoted. Um, Out of Houston, it, right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, the reason that I bring him up is um, I started doing insurance here in 2004, and I'll come back to Charles. In 2004, I went to work for a company called United American. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard of them. Oh, yeah. Uh, Adam familiar. McKinney. Yep. Um, if you have ever worked with United American, uh, it is one that uh, I always say I cut my teeth in insurance here in Austin with them um, very hard um, because as a new agent, which you, when you don't know a lot about a, certain products um, and they hand you a book and go here, figure it out. And then you go, okay. And then they go, and I'm like, okay, so do we get leads? And they hand you the phone book. Here it is. Start calling. Yeah. Um, so you can't do that with agents these days. No, not, you know not in mean? today's market. You can't. Not in today's market. They they want they want everything, right? So uh, so in two in two thousand six, no two thousand seven, I went to work with a company called America's Health Team out of Tennessee. And um, I, start, I became the Austin manager for them um, and started building a team of agents and had eight agents and we did major medical. Okay. That's what we did. Uh, we still did life, but mostly major medical. Um, and then in 2010, um, around 2010, um, I went to work with unique underwriters, which was UUI. Um, and the reason that I left was when Obamacare came in, we went from making money to making just like barely getting by, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Because the way we got paid with Obamacare was completely different. And uh, I needed something else to do. And uh, I met a friend of mine that, um, we did insurance together at United American. And he goes, hey, I'm working with this company and we're doing mortgage protection, universal lives, index, and all final expense and everything, right? And I was like, okay, yeah, let me check it out. So I went to work over there, um, just caught on. And the I, I joined in October of 2010. Um, by December, I had made the million dollar round table because I just came in and just put my head down, learned it and went out and people. And so I got in January when we went on the company, um, um, convention cruise, we had a, our convention on a cruise, which was really great. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but during that time, I um, I got a the Rising Star Award, and they made me an agency manager. And that's when I started um, really getting to know everybody. That's when I met Charles Prince. Charles okay. had his own agency with Unique Underwriters. Okay. So um, it was it was very uh, it, it me, seeing Charles again. Uh, last year was just kind of like a complete circle, right, of right, where right. I've been and and um, and just, you know, where we're going as, sure. as a company. But, you know, there's just a lot of things that you pick up along the way um, that it, it's it really molds you into who you are and how you mold 
your agents, right? So uh, unique underwriters fell apart um, about, gosh, in 2013, yeah. I want to say. It wasn't very long. Um, the five partners that started unique underwriters kind of went their own way. Therefore, everybody kind of went their own way. And, and um, I had started doing Medicare already before that happened and um, just hit the ground running. And um, I was um, uh, in 2015 um, is really when I started, I had done it for several years. And in 2015, I said, this is my year that I'm really gonna just, just go in and blow it up because I have to, right? And so, uh, but you know, as life hits you, um, you know, it's like life always has an extra, another plan, right? You have this plan mm -hmm. and then there's this plan. And so my husband got sick and ended up in a coma mm -hmm. in February of that year. And um, he was in a coma for two and a half months. Wow. Well, then um, he came out of it. And if you looked at my husband now, you would think nothing ever happened because uh, he is the most healthy person. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, my God, uh, <laughs> you are going to outlive everybody, you know, but <laughs> but, you know, things like that that happen in life, really, if you really pay attention are the things that really will drive you. Mm. Um, my, you know, you, you've been in the insurance age, in, in the insurance business as long as I have. So, you know, when people say, what is your why, right? Well, yeah. my yeah. why became gigantic because he couldn't work. Right. So I had to work. Um, and um, I just dove in and um, that was the one thing that really pushed me. And, um, I just started, I wasn't paying attention. And I remembered to all the, I had this one, um, one mentor that one told once told me when I went with him and I was, went to him for a session. And I said, you know, it's like everybody, this person is doing this, they're doing that. This person said they're doing it better. This per why can't we do this? And what? And he said, you need to cut out the noise. Mm. He said, put the blinders on and stay focused. Don't worry about who's doing what on the right, who's doing what's doing, you know, they're doing on the left. You stay focused on your goal and keep working. And that's what I did. And I did that for several, for a couple of years. And I was the number one agent with United Healthcare month after month after month after month the united healthcare came to me and said hey we would like for you to build the first uh imo of icas here in austin are you willing to do that and i said of course i said uh what does that mean <laughs> you know <laughs> what does that mean what does that mean and what does that mean to me it's a lot of you know? acronyms <laughs> in one sentence <laughs> right and so um they said basically you're going to build a team of captive agents for United Healthcare. We're, you're going to help develop them. You, they're, you'll do recruiting and, and building and make them, you know, we need you to duplicate who you are. Sure. Over and over and over and over and over again. And I was like, I can do that. You know, I've been doing that. When I was with Unique Underwriters, I had an agency here in Austin. I had one in the Rio Grande Valley. I had one in Florida and Miami. And then I had one in California and LA. And I was always on the plane because I was always building agencies. And so I'm like, I can do that, you know? And um, so I started doing that. We were very successful. Um, but then the next progression was, you know, let's go to the broker side. Mm -hmm. They weren't very happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. They weren't very happy with me because I was leaving, um, but they understood that that was the ne next progression yeah. for us, right? So, um, so yeah, it's uh, it's been an exciting ride, and see agents come and go, and that's okay, you know, because it's like 
the thing is not to just grow agents to um, to forever stay, right? We build the agents for them to grow and flourish. Yep. You know, and if if it's if you can't if you've done all you can do here, and you think there's more to somewhere else, then hey, go do it. You know, right? Because then I feel like I did my job. Right. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, it's exciting. I love that part of building people. Excellent. It is. Uh, I can certainly agree with you that it's, it's rewarding in that mm -hmm. regards, right. To see someone that you've helped develop accomplishing their goals, winning awards and so forth. And speaking of that, I mean, you have top producers in your crew that are getting recognized by carriers for top producer awards. Right. Um, what, what do you think it takes to become a top producer in the insurance space? It takes a lot of discipline because you have to be able to, remember we talked about, you got to plan your week. Yeah. You got to plan your week. You got to plan your month. You got to, you know, uh, plan your year. Um, your why has to be strong enough, right? Um, at the beginning of the year, I tell every agent, have you created a vision, a vision board? Do you know what your goals are for this year? If you don't know, then what are you, you're just showing up just to say you show up, you know? You have to know what your goals are so you can break them up by piece by piece, right? They say you don't eat an elephant all at once. You're one bite at a time. So when things look so monumental, people get uh, overwhelmed. They yeah. got to see it by piece by piece, right? So I helped them to break it down and say, okay, this is what you have to do this month. So how are we going to do it? We got to break it up to every week to every day. Are you in the field or are you on the phone or are you out prospecting? Are you out developing your business? What are you doing? You've got to be doing something every day. And it, I always tell them, you're, you're, it doesn't have to totally consume you. If you work it right and you give your business solid four to five hours every day doing one of those things, right? Either being on the phone, calling leads, doing events, doing business development, um, you know, customer service, all of those things. If you're doing those, then you're able to, you know, meet those goals. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is by doing those things every day, every week, every month, every year, you start building muscle memory where you go all of a sudden, hey, you need to write three to five apps every month. And you get overwhelmed as a new agent and go, how am I going to do that? You know? When you build that muscle memory, you go three to five. I could do that in my sleep. You know what right. I mean? So it's building that muscle memory. And that's what it takes to go out there and know your business, know what you're doing, know your product. If you don't know your product and you go out there and you're spending your time and you're spinning your wheels constantly going out there and trying, oh, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to get back to you. Yeah, that's not going to work, you know? Yeah, so, that only works for know, a little while. <laughs> so Eventually we do a, that game gets tired. Yeah, so we do a lot of product training, a lot of role playing, a lot of okay. uh, appointments setting together. Um, I go out with the agents in the field and I go, I know it's uncomfortable. You know, nobody wants to have, you know, somebody come with them because they feel they're being watched or they're going to get dinged if they do something wrong. And I'm like, it's not about that. It's about let's really hone in your skills and let's like really make them to where you're like, you don't even think about it anymore. You yeah. know what to do. So, yeah. So I think a lot of it goes, you know, when the agents learn all that, it becomes easy for them. And then, you know, hey writing 10 to 20 every month is not a big deal anymore. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Those leadership skills, right. That I, I'm assuming you learned most of them in the Marine Corps or there's certain ones that absolutely transition over to insurance. Was there new ways you had to approach it versus how you were approaching in the Marine Corps 
or are there just a complete set of new skills that you learned in the insurance industry to lead people? I would say probably 99% of the leadership skills that I learned in the Marine Corps transitioned into. Right. Now, of course, a lot of it I had to um, soften, <laughs> right? Because you can't just tell people you got to do this or I need you to go write 10 this week or, you know, this month, go do it. You know, um, you got to be able to soften those things and not um, because, hey, they're all 1099, right? So I can't right. tell them what to do. Um, I can advise them. I can guide them. I can teach them how to be disciplined. I can teach them how to be on the phone. I can teach them how to do all these things. But ultimately, it's up to them. Sure. Right. So that is one that I would say being hands off in that area took a lot for me to develop, to um, develop that letting go. When you, when you say hands off, letting go, or you, you get up, it's like leading the horse to water, right? You right. show them where it's to like, go and then you got to kind of step back and let them. Yeah. Are you going to do it? Right. It's like you lead them there. You're like, the water's right here. You could put their face right next to it and say it's right here it's up to them to follow through right. and so that I think was is is still one of the hardest things you know because um you know like you uh I'm sure you have agents that you that have been with you for a while and they're kind of like and then you'll go somewhere or you'll have somebody and they'll ask a question and you go, I swear I go over that 50 million <laughs> times. Right. So that, that taking my hands off of that, I, I think that's like, sometimes they say, I just want to bring them back together and choke you. <laughs> you know? Understood. It's like, don't you listen? But it's a, yeah, I think, you know, the most of my leadership skills were learned through that mm -hmm. um, by very um, seasoned uh, officers and, and non-officers that I learned a lot, right? Because you, in, in, the, um, in the military arena, you, you get to see a lot of leaders and they're different leadership styles sure right um and so um i can't just come in here and just boss everybody around because that's just not going to work um so a lot of it had to be softened from that and uh i take the approach of leading from the front so if my agents see that i'm a knack that i'm always working and that I'm always writing, then leading from the front becomes easy, right? Mm -hmm. But the key to a good leader is, um, I'm sure you've seen videos of formation runs and, mm -hmm. and you know, on um, where they, um, where you see a battalion of, of whether Marines or army or whatever, and they're running, right? One of the things that I used to do because I was one of the shortest people, <laughs> I would always, you know, I could keep up with the Marines if we were running with, you know, sometimes if, but if we, if we were running with a huge battalion, I could keep up with them, but it's kind of hard to uh, keep up the stride of somebody who's five, three with somebody who is six, four, right? right? So I would always volunteer to be road guard and road guard would be, we were sprinters basically. So every time a battalion would come to another crossing, we would sprint ahead of that entire battalion and then kind of like stop the, the traffic, right? But we're still running in place. And then they would all pass and you would ahead to the next one so one of the things and the reason I say that is because here's the thing with leadership if you lead from the front right you're that road guard always at the front you always have to go back 
to catch the last person in that battalion. And then you have to sprint to the front. So you never leave anybody in the back. You're constantly going back to those people in the back and helping them, developing them, keep up, keep up, keep up, keep up, right? What do you need? What do you, do you need more workouts? Do you need more of this, right? So it kind of transitions back into what we're doing. So you're constantly going back because you're only as good as your weakest soldier, right? Your yeah. weakest yeah. brain, always as weak as your, the chain is always as, weak, is, is as strong, right? As long as everybody's strong, but you're, but that weakest link for everything, right? It can rip that chain apart. So you have to go back and constantly develop those people that are coming up the back. So um, I've always taken that approach to where, and in between, you've got to help everybody else along the way to get them sure, to the front. Sure. So, um, so yeah, that's that's kind of my leadership style how I how I run the agency. That makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. How many people do you have in the Cochrane Group agency now that you're working with? Thirty six. 36. Fantastic. So at what point do you recognize that a top producer is no longer just a top producer, but they're a leader? Like where early does that transition on. come? You, you early see that? on. Okay. It, it's very early on because you can start seeing them and then you start developing them and you start uh, looking at them as, hey, where do you where do you see your career going? Do you just want to stay an agent? Would you like to develop into possibly getting your own agency? Because I can help you do that. I've done that many times, you know. So um, if they don't want, most agents don't want their own agency, you know, especially when they see the agency that they're with and how much work goes into it. Mm -hmm. They really kind of don't want to do that. They just want to do their own thing. The dangers and the pitfall of, of a long successful agent is when they get to a certain um, a certain level of success, a certain point in their book, that they start to take their hands off. Mm. Right? How do you keep them engaged? Becomes a little more difficult at that point, right? Because they're like. Ugh, well, I don't want to work this week. I'm I'm off this week. I'm going to be at the lake this week, or I'm going to be here. Right. I'm going to, you know. And so you go, okay, though, that's great. But where at least are you? Where's your ten this week, this month? Right? Where are you going to write those ten? So there definitely is a work-life balance, right? And mm -hmm. so. Um, still you know work to be done with those agents to help them figure out okay if you're going to be off two to three weeks this month what are you going to do on that one week that you are working right and can you write what you want to write during that week if not then maybe you don't you're not off three weeks you know um and tell you when I started, I I worked every day except Sunday, <laughs> you know. And so, but my drive and my wife was a little bit different. So, so yeah. So constantly keeping people involved and helping them manage their schedule, I think, is a big thing. After a while, they're like, "Hey, I'm working a week and a half, or I'm working every other week," and and um, I've already they already know. The days they're going to be, they know they're going to be on the phone two to three days, two days in the field. What are right. you doing? You know, um, and they know that they're scheduling all their appointments and how to schedule them. They already know those season agents. I don't have to do that. Um, uh, but, you know. It's a it's still not a hands off thing, sure. but it's like to, to develop them to say hey okay you know if you want to go to the next level it's going to take more time and more dedication right because the bigger the the reward the more work goes into it right and if you want to develop an agency well then definitely 
you need more work. And so that's, that's the thing is develop, it's learning how to identify those people that um, are ready for an agency um, that want to do that. Um, that is a, that is an interesting, uh, it has its own dynamics to it, right? Sure. So, um, but, um, but I love that. I love to see people, I, building people is, is, is really exciting to me. Yeah, I, I enjoy it as well. One of the hardest things that I've found when it comes to developing uh, good people, good leaders, uh, comes down to when you have to discipline them or when you have to correct them. Do you have a certain methodology or kind of philosophy or thought process when it comes to that time where you have to step in and, and, and bloody their nose yourself a little bit? Yeah. And as you know, uh, sometimes that doesn't go very well, right? Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, talking to them about when you have to discipline them for something they didn't do right, you know, or, or something, you know, whatever the case is, um, it's usually met with the first, I always feel like it's always meant met with, uh, some sort of defense, right? Sure. They feel like, wait a minute. And then you have those agents that are like, I'm a 1099 employee. You can't tell me anything. Well, well, yes, I can. <laughs> you know, yes, I can. Right. You made a commitment to this agency. <laughs> and so, um, so it, um, uh, it's not hard for me to do. Um, but I take the approach of we're partners. So if I'm doing something wrong, I expect you to tell me, mm. but if you're doing something wrong, I'm going to come to you with the facts and what happened here. Let's talk about it. Cause this can't happen again, you know, kind of thing. Um, I've had uh, to let go of several agents um, for doing things that weren't compliant and um, they understood um, and they went on. So, um, but um, it's, it's not a, it's definitely the least <laughs> enjoyable thing I, I like to do. Absolutely. I, do, I don't like doing that. Um, but, it has to be done, right? Um, in order for people to grow, sometimes corrective actions need to be taken. Um, and, you know, some bad habits need to be broken. You know, that's why a lot, I know a lot of agency owners would say, I would prefer a neophyte agent over a seasoned agent, mm -hmm. right? Because that new agent, you can just bring them in and mold them. Right. Versus breaking bad habits. And so, yeah, it's um, it's one of those things that it's like, it's a necessity, but mm, nobody wants to do it, right? <laughs> True. Absolutely. I, th I, I feel like some of the, the balancing act there, right, is you got to make sure you correct them, but you can't correct them so much that you destroy their self-confidence. Exactly. You got to build them back. It's like if you... If you bring them down, I don't want to say tear them down because you never want to do that. But if you bring them down to the nitty gritty of everything that was done and it, most of them are going to feel a little beat up, then you have to build them back up. Hey, but this is what you're doing that's so great. I need you to keep working on this. You do this, you do that, whatever it is. But you build that agent right back up to when, when they walk out of there, it's like, hey, I'm back to work now, you know, yeah. because it's not, you never want to tear an agent down. You never want to break them. You know, it's always about developing, developing, correcting along the way to where you get that top producer, right? And you get that top producer that is not, um, that you don't have to worry about. Sure. You're just there to support when they need it. Uh, so I think that's, you know, that's that's the thing there. When you're correcting, if you're correcting, don't be so drastic that you hurt them. And by hurting them, I'm, I'm saying you, you, they develop that, um, that 
I hate this agency. I don't want to work with her. She's horrible. You know, she's this, whatever, right? You correct the action and then you build them back up. You show them what, how to do things different so that doesn't happen again, and then build them to where they're back on the road to, to growth, right? So that's, that's, I think that's key. Yeah, I agree 100%. This has been fantastic. I really appreciate you taking time uh, to chat with us. I, I just one real quick question that I, you know, number one, well, a couple of quick things, but if you were talking to a new agent today, that's brand new. They're like, Hey, I'm, I want to get into this insurance thing, right? What is probably the first piece of advice that you would toss out on if they're going to direct themselves towards any form of success? Ooh. Um, first off would be, what are, what do you want to get out of this? Uh, what are your goals? Why do you think you want to do this? Because it's not an easy job. Right. I always tell people it's the easiest, hardest job you'll ever do. And when people go, hardest thing I'll ever do, the hardest thing, it comes from the discipline. Mm -hmm. Are you disciplined to do this? So that's that's one of the things that I would say. Easy. Once you learn the products, you learn that every carrier is about the same and, you know, they're the the only thing that's different is what they cover and what they don't cover you know right. um but other than that do you have the drive and the discipline to do this because it is hard you have to you have to be uh self motivated you've got to learn how to take initiative you've got to have the drive to do that and if you don't have the discipline the drive and all that other stuff that goes with it this might not be the career choice for you, but if you do and you have that commitment to yourself, you know, and maybe that's the thing right there. Are you committed to your own success? Mm -hmm. Because if I can help you, but I'm not going to drag you along the way. Right. Right. Um, like we said, we can take him all the way to the water, but we can't put their head in there and say drink. <laughs> Right. We can hold it down a little, though, maybe. Um. But, yeah, but, you know, those would be the things. It's like, because you do have to have those in order to succeed. It's not one where you just show up and you're going to get paid. Absolutely. I like that you go to setting the compass point first. Right? Where are you going? What is it that you're trying to accomplish? Right. You know, yeah. so you're looking at that and then obviously the drive that back that, and discipline that backs it up. Do you think yeah. it's possible to teach someone discipline? Or is absolutely. that just an innate thing? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that you can teach that. But you will have those people that are unteachable. Sure. Right. And those you quickly learn that, hey, you know what? I don't think this is going to be for you. I don't need just another. Uh, I've got those people who are just taking up seats in my agency, as we all do. And they can, you know, they're like, oh, okay, well, AEP is coming up. What do I need to do? You know? And it's like, you've been doing this for years. How do you not know what you got to do? <laughs> Get certified. For crying. <laughs> yep. Get <laughs> certified. Know? Get your marketing in order and get ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, they, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Fatal. Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate you taking time. I certainly appreciate you guys always tuning in, but this has been super special. We've had some great comments, great engagement. Uh, the only other thing I'm, I'm curious or want to ask is just, you know, if agents want to reach out to you, they want to get in touch with you, they want to learn uh -huh. from you or just kind of pick your brain a little bit. How do they get in touch with you? How do they contact you? Well, you can contact me at the Conquering Group, of course, um, theconqueringgroup.com or Adela. A-D-E-L-A at theconqueringgroup.com or 512-627-3475. So yeah, we're in the middle of a big recruiting campaign, but um, always looking for great agents, right? So um, yeah, so we are located in Cedar Park at 1150 South Bell Boulevard, Building 5 in Cedar Park, 
Texas, 78613. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, man. This thank has been you. a great show. I'm certainly looking forward yeah. to hearing you on stage and Invictus. For any of you guys going, she's one of our keynote speakers. So get excited. And if you haven't got your ticket, make sure you get your ticket. And then just a couple of final notes, you know, um, other than that, uh, tune in every week because we are here at 9 a.m. every Tuesday. And I know we got Walter Bernoulli Pernez coming up pretty soon. Genius content creator in the Hispanic space. And uh, I think that is pretty much it. We've thank announced you. everything else. So thank, thank you, you, Adela, for tuning in or for joining us. And thank you guys for tuning in. We will see you next week, 9 a.m. for Tuesday training. Have an awesome, awesome week out there. Thank you, everybody.